Yeah, and here we are again. Good evening, Lee. everybody. How's it going, uh, Lee? Let's see who yeah. we got with us. Got a few. You know, I'll let the music play just a little while there to give the thronging masses their time to assemble. Yeah, I mean, there's just too many to count now, mate. Those yeah, Chiro Nelson's sounds. Here. Here. Ted Branson, sounds. Chiro Sounds. How you doing, Jake? Glenn Dennison's here. Uh, Gerald, Midwest Night Watchers is here. R.P. Skaza, how you doing? Uh, I think everybody's a moderator, it looks like. <laughs> it's, it's Mod Town. It's the mod squad, and we're not talking about we're not talking about that that the music mod mod music no. mods and rockers. I I get a, a feeling that you were a rocker, Lee, and not a mod. Yeah, yeah, I was a rocker, mate, not a mod. You didn't yeah, have. I wasn't, the, I wasn't the, much the, into the ska music, mate. I didn't mind a bit of bad manners and a bit of uh, you know madness. Like madness. Welcome to the house of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't mind a bit of that, but. No, yeah, I like some of the two tone and Scott. Reminds me, I've been creating a bunch of playlists over on Spotify. I'll have to do one two tone and Scott. Now there's the '60s mods, and then there is the late '70s, early '80s mods. Yeah, well, that, that's more me. No, uh, you know, obvious, obviously. I mean, obviously, isn't it? You know, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, Ted Branson <laughs> called you Haley. Yeah, what's that? Uh, Ted Branson called you Haley. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'll get I'll get sick of that. You know, I mean, I know I look like a girl. But... <laughs> I know. I mean, in nowadays, I am one hell of an attractive girl as well. I mean, come on. You are. Not every yeah. girl can grow a beard like that. Women's bathrooms, here I come. <laughs> but your but your voice is really deep. Yeah. Are you saying I'm not a woman? <laughs> uh hello Gerald. midwest there there he is i sent you an email earlier Gerald. i replied Don't to your email <laughs> yeah i saw your email earlier didn't open it but i saw it <laughs> that's not very funny steve uh, how's everybody uh, uh, you're the one laughing i don't <laughs> i'm just laughing at myself you know i'm like laughing i started looking own, in the mirror laughing at me, own right? jokes, uh... Oh, I look in the mirror and giggle, mate, you know. <laughs> I, I've done that before. And then, and then I put my clothes on and I left the house. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, an activist and a vegan jump out of an aeroplane. Who wins? <laughs> Everybody. Society. <laughs> Right. <laughs> He's got a million though, folks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the comedy Thank style of Lee G. Thank you very much. Tip I'm your waitress. They work for. I'm here all week. <laughs> uh, try the brisket. Yeah. <laughs> Who wins the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. See, you're right, mate. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So what we, we got tonight? We're gonna tonight. we're gonna do the. Uh, the Roswell. We got, we're back to Roswell again. This is uh, the Roswell reports, and uh, this is put together. I don't think I, I didn't put much in the description. This is from uh, the Federal Archives, or the what do you call it? The uh, not the Federal Archives. Uh, I got the wrong thing open here. It's from um, the National Archives and Records Administration. Right. And they've got a multi-part series uh, from. Uh, it's got stuff from the Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force, the Office of the Secretary, Office of the Administrative Assistant, Office of the Deputy for Security and Special Investigations Program, Research Declassification Team. So you know it's going to be good. Right. But, uh, right. It's, uh, <laughs> all this was, uh, this film was written and produced by Captain James McAndrew, uh, who was, uh, they summoned him up to accompany the U.S. Air Force 1987 publication of the Roswell Report, case closed. So, again. Ah, ah did they now, right? It's uh, the, the fox uh, telling the hen house how safe everything is. Yeah, well, that's it. Well, just as safe as it would be if you ducked and covered in a nuclear yeah. attack. You know, that... Yeah, you're hiding under a wooden desk. Like, yeah, I mean, there, that, that's the idea. I mean, you know, you're only going to evaporate, but, you know, hey-ho. That, that, uh ducking underneath a wooden table that'll save you <laughs> oh, i loved my childhood school was yeah, great and, and i grew up in oak ridge tennessee and you know we had those uh the, the practice drills when the warning thing would go off oh. uh, the imminent nuclear attack warning and 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, would be later in life. They did it on the, the first Wednesday of every month, and I'd always forget what day it was. And you're doing something here that, and then comes over, take cover, take cover, and you know, in the event of an actual emergency, that well, we need to put one, your head between your legs and uh, kiss your tail goodbye. One, but. one day, m my brothers and I were all playing outside in the eighties, early early eighties. It might have been before that, might be late seventies, early eighties. And this siren started going off. You see, you get there, and we are this literally, you know, when you, you get that shiver up your spine sort of thing, where everybody else ran for cover, sort of ran in their house. Me, I goes running looking for where the sound's <laughs> coming from because I, I want to know where the sound's coming from because that was more, I don't know, it's just something about the sound. I want to, I want to know where it came from. Yeah. Got to, Same got with to those... our main, well, got to our main road. And it was a yeah. crane. It was a crane changing one of the light bulbs on <laughs> the lamps on the thing. Take as cover. It, as, it, as it was climbing, it was a warning thing to let them know. It was a crane going up. And then the other ones that used to scare me, particularly as a kid, was those uh, emergency alert. And the TV. And I had this been an actual, this is only a test of the. Uh, Emergency warning system. Had this yeah. been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed where to tune in your area for official uh, details or something like that. I almost have it down, but that's that's ingrained in my head from childhood. But I was scared of the Jesus out of you, you know. And then yeah, they, oh, they, they, do, they, they love that fear monger thing, don't they? Keep you under, keep you under control, mate. That's what that's about. This is a test. This is only a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test on how much we can frighten you. <laughs> Yay! Go us. <laughs> uh, in school you'd have those uh, fire and then they go to the bohemian like, grove and have a big party and celebrate yeah. what they did to us speaking Yay! of bohemian grove i've got a video about that coming up in uh, i think it's the day yeah. after tomorrow see that's, so a, that's, that's that interests me that. it does you know let, let's that's, let's that's burn that's an effigy of a baby at, at, at um bohemian grove in Yay! front of a giant we'll owl about statue what we're gonna do to the people named moloch and then uh, all these uh, men uh, prance around in uh hula skirts yeah. and things and uh yeah. Pee on yeah. trees. Yeah. Yeah. They had Great a bunch of people. Lovely bunch of people they are, mate, with their 20, 30 agenda and stuff. They're, they're, yeah. they're lovely people. I'll, I'll have nothing said about them, mate, apart from they're evil. <laughs> Interesting, nonetheless. <laughs> and loonies. But a well, lot of them. Let's go ahead and fire this up here and see oh, what. Uh, go for it, mate. Go for it. I'm to really say. excited. I'm excited. I don't there know about we go. You. That's a mystery science conspiracy theater. 3000. There you go. Here we go. Oh, you know, with music like that, it's good. it sounds like one of your tunes, Lee. That does sound like one of my tunes. An event popularly known as the Roswell incident has recently been the subject of intense interest by both the media and a curious general public. In recent years, numerous speculative books, magazine articles, television programs, a made for TV movie, two UFO museums, fraudulent documents, and even an alien autopsy film have emerged to exploit the media fascination with the Roswell incident. The story has even gained international attention. Despite the vested interest and questionable credibility of all sources involved in generating the media hype, the U.S. Air Force is routinely accused of concealing a deep, dark secret from the American people. In early 1994, New Mexico Congressman Stephen Schiff requested the General Accounting Office initiate a records review. The purpose of this review was to determine if the U.S. Air Force or any other U.S. government agency possessed information on an alleged crash near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947 of an extraterrestrial vehicle and its alien crew. In response to the GAO probe, the Secretary of the Air Force directed a comprehensive search for records. The objective of this search was to tell the Congress and the American people what the Air Force knew about the 1947 Roswell claims. If the information was still classified, it was to be declassified. If active or former Air Force officials had signed non-disclosure agreements, they were to be released from these agreements. The resulting 800-page report was completed in July 1994. 
The report concluded that the predecessor to the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Army Air Forces, did recover material near Roswell in July 1947. What was recovered was not the remains of an extraterrestrial spacecraft and its alien crew, but debris from a then-classified Army Air Forces research project codenamed Mogul. <laughs> Begun in 1946, Project Mogul was a top-secret attempt to acoustically detect suspected Soviet nuclear explosions and ballistic missile launches. The project was accorded the highest priority because it addressed the most important post-war national defense concern, development of an early warning system to prevent a devastating surprise attack. Mogul used an odd assortment of naval acoustical sensors, radar reflecting targets, nylon fibers, and other equipment carried aloft by a train of weather balloons extending over 600 feet. Claims that the U.S. Army Air Forces recovered a flying disc near Roswell in 1947 were based primarily on yeah, the misidentification of the radar targets. Saucer. Easy. Yeah, I, I can see that. It's just like what I would think yeah, of as a UFO. Yeah. Exactly like, you know, that would cover a mile's worth of debris as well, wouldn't it? The oddly constructed radar targets were found by a local rancher who later reported the equipment as a flying disc. Following some initial confusion at Roswell Army Airfield, the flying disc debris, aluminum foil, rubber, paper, and sticks, must have been made by NASA. Army Air Force officials as remnants That's of it. radar targets yeah. and weather balloons. Never a straight With answer. the positive identification by the Army Air Forces of the debris recovered by the rancher, events that occurred in 1947 were officially resolved and largely forgotten. Initially, the Roswell incident consisted only of accounts of the recovery of a flying disc. In 1947, hey, there Jabba were no claims of alien bodies associated Jabba. with the Roswell incident. The recovery of alien bodies became part of the Roswell Henry story Nelson, during the late I 1970s, you not. with other claims being made in the 1980s and 1990s. These later day revisions to the Roswell story were often based on anecdotal accounts from second and third hand witnesses collected by UFO enthusiasts 40 or more years after the actual event. The same anecdotal accounts that refer to bodies also describe large scale field operations conducted by US military personnel using an assortment of military vehicles and aircraft to recover crash debris supposedly from an extraterrestrial spaceship. Military personnel were allegedly led by an angry red-headed captain threatening those who witnessed the operation with imprisonment or death if they revealed what they observed. The popular Roswell story contends that the bodies, once recovered, were allegedly transported under tight security to the base hospital at Roswell Army Airfield for autopsy. At the hospital, the angry red-headed captain was again allegedly observed threatening civilians. Following the purported autopsies, the alien bodies were supposedly transported to Wright Field, Ohio, now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, for further processing and storage. This summarizes the Roswell incident scenario as presented by UFO enthusiasts. On the surface, this explanation may appear plausible to some, However, things are not always as they appear. The reports of bodies were only briefly discussed in the 1994 Air Force report because the search for records from 1947, the year of the alleged incident, did not yield any data to support a 1947 claim of alien bodies. However, following the release of the 1994 report, additional research uncovered information which explains some of the claims of alien bodies associated with the Roswell incident. From the additional research, a second report was written which critically examined the anecdotal claims and descriptions of flying saucers. So a second report written to address the first report. Of unusual Air Force activities in the New Mexico desert. Yeah. This in-depth examination revealed that many of these claims were reasonably accurate descriptions of Air Force activities. Some of the claims that refer to bodies are most likely misperceptions by uninformed persons of unclassified and widely publicized Air Force scientific achievements of the 1950s. However, other descriptions of bodies 
appear to be exploitation of Air Force members killed or injured in the line of duty. The following are the five main conclusions contained in the second report. Research reveals that actual U.S. military operations, widely separated by time, geographical location, and purpose, have been misinterpreted or deliberately misrepresented. These misrepresentations collectively created what is known as the Roswell Incident. UFO proponents failed to establish accurate dates of reported eyewitness accounts, in some instances by more than a decade. In addition, they erroneously linked all these accounts to the actual 1947 recovery of Project Mogul equipment. Eventually, these misrepresentations transformed a series of verifiable Air Force activities into what some have described as the extraterrestrial event of the millennium. Reports of aliens in the New Mexico desert were actually anthropomorphic test dummies that were carried aloft by Air yeah, Force you'd high altitude them research aliens, balloons. Easy. <laughs> Critical examination of alleged yeah. alien sightings consistently match the physical characteristics of these dummies as well as where and how yeah. they were used. Pretty really easy to, to mistake Vince, them that new dummy cam is for great. aliens. Yeah, it'll sure give people a whole new outlook on what it's like when you don't wear a safety belt. No! No! I think they'll get the picture. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Anthropomorphic dummies, also known as crash test dummies, are today easily identifiable and are even stars of their own successful auto safety advertising campaign. However, during the 1950s, public awareness was still decades away for these important scientific tools. From 1953 to 1959, so it was an anthropomorphic dummy riding a winter weather balloon. Used by yeah, the well, US that's what it was, Mike, because they, they, you know. And projects High Dive but, and Excelsior. There you go. I just, the project's main objective was to study even methods someone that's never seen one before would understand. It's like a show doing dummy. Or, you know what I mean? They'd realize it's to eject at extremely dull, high altitudes. You know? For these tests, a little craft work for you there. We're all showroom dummies. By high yeah. altitude balloons. We are sure really Looks like a side of beef there. Oh no, it's two of them. The dummies were released for a free fall period, during which body movements and escape equipment performance were recorded by a variety of instruments. Many of the dummies landed outside the confines of military reservations and were regularly observed by local civilians. Who never came forward saying Following that we found an alien of body. Tests, a human subject, Air Force test pilot <laughs> Captain Joseph W. Kittinger Jr., now a retired colonel, time. made three bailouts <laughs> from high altitude balloons. These and other aeromedical projects that used both dummies and human test subjects were unclassified and widely publicized in the press and other media. It's like Steve Carroll there. In 1956, 20th Century Fox released On the Threshold of Space, a feature-length motion picture based on these projects and filmed on location at Holloman Air Force Base. Air Force personnel, aircraft, high-altitude balloons, and other equipment, including the actual anthropomorphic dummies, were used in the making of this film. God, that looks so alien. It's scary. <laughs> the eyewitness reports of military units that always seemed to arrive shortly after the alleged crash of a flying saucer were actually accurate descriptions of Air Force personnel engaged in high-altitude balloon and anthropomorphic dummy recovery operations. Since 1947, Air Force atmospheric research organizations at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico, have launched and recovered approximately 2,500 high-altitude balloons, many in the same areas of New Mexico where the Roswell incident allegedly occurred. Additionally, the equipment, vehicles, and procedures used by the Holloman Air Force Base Balloon Branch, the unit that conducted most of the launches, are the same as that described by the reputed witnesses 
who that claimed like alien they saw type the to recovery me. of the flying saucer and alien crew. These huge Air Force high-altitude balloons, launched by the Holloman Balloon Branch, carried aloft a wide range of sophisticated and, from <coughs> most perspectives, odd-looking devices. Much None of, of which resemble a flying disc, I'm sorry. And represented and for that era the latest in space age technology. Payloads ranged you know, from simple radio transmitters to, super to sophisticated to satellite and components that and that NASA space mate. probes. You know. In fact, qualification trials for the NASA Voyager Mars and Viking space probes were flown by Air Force high altitude balloons during the late 1960s and early 1970s. But this, yeah, the Roswell was in 1947. These balloons were launched yep. from the former Roswell Army Airfield, site of the originally alleged 1947 incident, and recovered on the White Sands Missile Range over 100 miles to the west. Even that, if that landed like that, and you saw that, it'd be attached to a parachute. You'd assume it was something to do with a rocket. Yeah. You know, end of. You wouldn't think, oh, look, that's a flying saucer. Recovering the balloon yeah. payloads was essential for accomplishing the scientific objectives of the high-altitude balloon program. The primary high-altitude balloon recovery areas were and still are located at predetermined sites throughout Arizona, West Texas, and New Mexico, including the area surrounding Roswell. To retrieve the equipment many miles from Holloman Air Force Base, recovery personnel operated a variety of aircraft and vehicles. The exact vehicles described by the witnesses as having been present at the crashed flying saucer sites. To expedite these operations, the recovery crews tracked the balloons optically, electronically, and from aircraft, which directed ground vehicles to the impact areas. In several of the Roswell accounts, unsubstantiated allegations asserted that military personnel who retrieved equipment from rural areas of New Mexico intimidated and threatened civilians on the scene. On the contrary, Balloon Branch personnel enjoyed good relations with the local community and often solicited their assistance following a balloon or payload landing. In the course of their activities, recovery personnel rented or borrowed tractors, bulldozers, snowmobiles, and even pack mules from local residents. The payloads, parachutes, balloons, and circling chase aircraft often draw crowds of curious onlookers from the local community. In fact, so many civilians are often present at balloon or payload landing sites, the scenes were once described by balloon branch personnel as being like the circus coming to town. Here's what it looked like this afternoon, floating from east to west over town. It was way up there, all right, some 25 miles over our heads, the Air Force later told me. The giant helium-filled balloon eventually collapsed, falling to Earth like a thousand pounds of cellophane, landing on the Gila Indian Reservation southwest of Phoenix. A short while later, we spotted this, a large parachute, perhaps 100 feet across. Dangling beneath it was some sort of a silver box that made a rather hard landing. This is what had been attached to that balloon we would later find out. There were no markings on it. No way at all of telling Weather what it was. Or like a flying privy. Then the Air Force pulled up. Excuse me, we don't mean to be too nosy, but about a million people in Phoenix are dying to know. What is it? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> this is a scientific payload that was launched from Mahalaman Air Force Base in New Mexico. How, how far are we? About 400 miles? Okay, it went up to uh, approximately 125,000 feet in the air, uh, carried aloft by an 11 million cubic foot balloon. So there you have it, an Air Force experiment to gather information on gases in the upper atmosphere. There you go, weather Thank thing. Thank goodness it was one of ours. Len Clements, an alien spaceship, mate, and those little men in it. In addition to high-altitude balloons, 
the Holloman Balloon Branch also launched low-altitude tethered balloons. These tethered balloons may I have inspired at least right. one account of an alien craft associated with the Roswell incident. In a popular book, the authors present a drawing of a crashed spaceship allegedly given to them by an anonymous witness. When this drawing is compared to a photograph of an experimental tethered balloon flown at Holloman Air Force Base in March 1965, the similarities are undeniable. Except there's about 20 years difference. Yep, yeah. and materials would be different, I would have thought as well, because the other thing would be like a rubber thing. And I'm pretty the sure any was human being would realize something blown Kittinger up Jr. with um, air. Captain sort of thing, or, you know, served whatever. as the project officer or, or pilot you know, in whether all it's made three of, an of the Air Force's material. manned high altitude balloon projects Man High, Excelsior, and Stargazer. Captain Kinniger was present at many balloon and dummy launch and recovery sites throughout the southwest United States during the 1950s and early 1960s. The NASA approved uh, Elmer Fudd hat there. However, other than the allegations made by UFO proponents, there is no evidence of any kind that Kittinger confronted or threatened civilians. Colonel Kittinger's achievements as an Air Force test oh, pilot are legendary. He has the yeah. standing world he knows record parachute up. jump. Um, Eisenhower was there when he shook hands with him. Eisenhower, him. his granddaughter, a friend of mine. I mean, I'm going to see if I can get her on here with us. He made a deal, made a deal with him. Well, a deal, but that yeah, it was him and uh, like Adolf an and uh, Churchill and uh, Crowley. And, and uh, with an aerial victory. I think Roosevelt was there too. And uh, Laura North talks North. about it. So it was like an open secret in their family. We'll get her on here some night and, and see what she has to say. After over 480 combat missions, Colonel Kittinger was shot down over North Vietnam and spent 10 months as a prisoner of war in the infamous Hanoi Hilton before being repatriated in March 1973. Colonel Kittinger made history again after retiring from the Air Force. In 1984, he accomplished the first solo crossing of the Atlantic by balloon. The final and most disturbing conclusion of the second Roswell report is the apparent exploitation of Air Force members killed or injured in the line of duty to perpetuate the alleged sightings of alien bodies. Claims of bodies at the Roswell Army Airfield Hospital were likely a combination of several aircraft accidents and an unusual manned balloon mishap. One aircraft accident occurred on June 26, 1956. Eleven Air Force members died when their fully loaded KC-97 tanker aircraft experienced a propeller failure four and a half minutes after takeoff. The crash site was approximately nine miles south of the former Roswell Army Airfield, renamed Walker Air Force Base in 1948. The badly burned bodies of the 11 crewmen were identified and processed at the Walker Air Force Base Hospital. The alleged claims of bodies at base hospital can be traced to a single witness whose descriptions closely match the condition and the circumstances under which these victims were identified. Furthermore, claims of bodies attributed to specific Air Force personnel are unsubstantiated. Some of these individuals were not even present at Roswell Army Airfield in July 1947. The balloon mishap occurred during a low-level training mission for backup pilots in the Project Excelsior High Altitude Man Balloon Program. This unusual accident occurred approximately 10 miles northwest of Walker Air Force Base on May 21, 1959. One of the three crewmen, Captain Dan D. Fulgham, now a retired colonel, was injured during landing. Following the mishap, Captain Fulgham and the other balloon crew members were transported to the Walker Air Force Base Hospital via a chase helicopter that followed the training mission for emergency purposes. Upon arrival at the highly secure Strategic Air Command Base, the balloon crew was met by like armed Air Force security personnel who remained with the crew Hello. until their there identities she is. were confirmed. As the Excelsior project officer and instructor pilot for this mission, the red-headed Captain Kittinger accompanied the balloon crew to the hospital. At the Walker Air Force Base Hospital, Kinniger and Fulgham were apparently observed by individuals who later related this unusual incident. 
Elements of this actual event now appear to be part of the Roswell story. Captain Fulgham was treated for an injury that caused his head to swell beyond its normal size. The injury, described as a traumatic hematoma, was not he was serious. pretending to be an alien. On a specially arranged flight several days after the accident, Fulgham returned to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, where he made a complete recovery. Fulgham went on to distinguish himself as a test parachutist and physiologist for the space program. He later flew F-4s in Southeast Asia, adding to his combat record as a fighter pilot during the Korean War. When critically examined, the Roswell incident is exposed as a conglomeration of many events, including aircraft accidents, that occurred over several decades. Misidentification of anthropomorphic dummies and experimental balloon launch devices combined with Air Force balloon operations portrayed as mysterious flying saucer and alien recovery teams transformed verifiable events into what is now known as the Roswell incident. The U.S. Air Force and its predecessors have been the unsurpassed innovators in aerospace technology. Legendary Air Force leaders throughout this century have used technological advances to establish the U.S. Air Force as a premier military service. The facts presented in the reports examining the so-called Roswell incident did not reveal it to be a dark secret or government cover-up as persons unacquainted with Air Force technologies proclaim. Hey, Griffey. These studies identified a collection of events that exemplify the technological leadership, dedication to duty, and continuing noble sacrifices of the men and women of the United States Air Force. Well, that was still a lot of wasn't it? Yeah, you look at the credits, okay. Yeah, there's nothing to see here, folks. Move right along. Yeah. And this oh, is just part dear. one of many. We'll, we'll get a longer one for you next time or maybe string a couple of them together. But uh, there you go. Yeah, they, they pretty much say the same thing. It wasn't, look, you, you're, what, you're thinking about the wrong thing. It, it, was, an, it was a weather balloon. It was uh, Filters, crash test dummies and uh, gas. yeah, there you go. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I like I say, you, I, I definitely myself personally, I definitely. There's the, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Air Force identification chart. Yep, uh, exactly. it's all weather balloon except for the actual weather balloon, except and that's the swamp balloon, gas. Just swamp gas. Yeah, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I, like I, said, I, I know for a fact, if I'd have seen those dummies laid on the floor, I'd have definitely mistaken them for alien beings. Yeah, it looks like a gray I, alien with a big head and no mouth and slits. Oh, wait a minute. No, it looks uh, like a human. Okay. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd easily mistake that for, you know, something that's not of this world, you know, even though it was, it's made autonomously to look like us and, um, you know, for the crumple zones or whatever to see how it breaks on it. I mean, because nowadays they use them, don't they? Put those little patches in them like they used to do in Mythbusters. And, you know, if they break, that means you've died or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, impact things, you know. But, um, yeah, it's just, they, they really, back then, they really did take people for stupid, didn't they? You know, it's like, look, look, it was, I mean, they come out one day that we found this disc, right, with a mile's worth of debris scattered everywhere. Right, and these bodies that are little things. I mean, those things weren't three foot, were they? Right. Nope. So these five bodies or whatever, six bodies. Well, I can't remember how many bodies could have been up to nine. I've not, I've no idea. Right, I can't remember the numbers, but because the number always seems to change. And but then they the hustled bodies, the bodies of the crash test dummies out of there and took them to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah, because they'd need to. Why did they go wherever. asking about coffin sizes and you know can I have some children's <laughs> yeah, coffins? They wanted please. to give the crash test dummies a, a, a decent a proper burial. burial. You know that, yeah, that you that's right, mate. Because they wouldn't want to use them again and again and again, would they? You know, the one it time you be clear, dummies have rights too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I 
Hey, that should be on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> dummies have rights. <laughs> dummies, dummies' lives matter. <laughs> so, but yeah, like I said, who's going to mistake a a human, an adult, human adult-sized, um, could you know, cadaver dummy sort of thing, right? With a three-foot, massive head, with big almond eyes. You know, um, in like a silver jumpsuit or whatever they were, black jumpsuits, whatever they were. Do you, do you know what I mean? Who's yeah? You you. I don't think you know. Even back then in 1947, I don't think you'd mistake those for um, cadavers that weren't uh, you know for dummies that were f thrown from aeroplanes kind of thing to see what happens when they hit the deck. And, and, and <laughs> not to mention the fact. They they would have no need to test them there, uh, you know. Let them go off into the sky. No, why even test on the dummy? If if anything hits the ground from that height, it's gonna it's pop just or gonna splatter. explode, isn't it? So yeah. there's, what, what's the point of do, of doing an experiment like that? It's absolute BS, mate. That they would use those dummies for things like testing new parachute systems and stuff, you know. Yeah, that and those things probably that. cost a lot of money, cost a lot of taxpayer money to make. Yeah, oh, and, they uh, don't care about that, mate. I mean, come on, they buy, spoon, they buy spoons at stuff. 10 grand a piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a toilet seat at 15 million pound, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the infamous uh, toilet seat for what was the space shuttle or the, uh, uh, the Skylab or Soyuz or one of those yeah, things. Yeah, whatever, it's... 15 million pound for a toilet. Yeah, that's it. Because that's how much it costs, you know. Come on. Better better have a bidet for that kind of money. Jeez. Uh, what it wants to come out and do is polish my ass after that, mate. <laughs> for that money. It needs to come with a little little servant person. <laughs> that, that's you know, the little... That's preferably the little... a blonde woman with breasts out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now <Ellie. laughs> <laughs> You should write that up in a, in a proposal for uh, the government. I think I think I could sell that idea. I really do. You know, I, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. Give, give them some some music it, there. For check this for emails coming soon. Make up uh, a, a pitch deck or get it on uh, GoFundMe or Kickstarter, and uh, you might be on to something. You know, you know, I get some funding for that, mate. There'd be <laughs> there'd be plenty of funding for that. You know. Yeah, it's just it's just ridiculous what they want you to believe. You know that. Yeah, what we actually found was this um, balloon that's just made of tin foil and stuff, and um, and some tape, and um, it's easily mistaken for odd materials that react really weirdly and stuff. Yeah, very very easy to to um, to mistake, uh, you know, for an alien craft because you know us humans aren't very discerning, you know. <laughs> That that's the thing, right? I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure to say, if we found something, the likes of you and I, we're just average everyday human beings, right? If we found something on a beach that maybe was tethered to a, a bit of rope or you know, a lots of strings and stuff, you'd assume straight away that's come from a parachute, right? You'd be able to tell by the way the nylon is or whatever that it's, that it's human made just from that alone. So if there was something that crashed, the balloons are tethered by strings as well, by rope, if you know what I mean, yeah? By by ropes, uh, plural. And yeah, you, cord just, type just from that alone, from the cording, <laughs> you would have known straight away that was a man-made thing. You wouldn't even need to know what the metals are and stuff. And yes, it might be a strange-looking object, but you can go into a workshop and not know what the objects are in a workshop. You know, so, or in a science lab. You wouldn't know what they are. But you definitely wouldn't go in there and say, oh, that looks like it's made by aliens. Because yeah, yeah. We, we basically would just look at it and go, well, that must be a tool for something. It must be used for something. I wonder yeah. what it is. And you'd look around yeah. it. And, and if it's something that, you, for, say, for instance, if it had handles or anything like that on it, then that would be for human hands. So you'd start thinking things like that as well, if you really want to be discerning about it, you know. It's just it's just crazy how they think that people are so thick that you wouldn't be able to tell that it's, you know, 
that that it, it's something that we've made as opposed to something that's just otherworldly. Uh, so it's far material beyond. that uh, you can crush it and bend it, and then it goes back to its original shape, and it has strange yeah. hieroglyphics all over it. And, and yet it's some really, language. really strong, and yet you can't cut it, and you can't bet. You know what I mean? You can't fold it into a shape, and it stays there. It just, it's just. It's just like I said, these people, especially 1947. Yeah, and I think what they showed in the picture there that was part of a weather balloon, but that's not what crashed out there that yes. caused all the excitement. Yeah. They're like, "Here, go take that aluminum foil, go stand over here, we're going to take a picture and say this is what." Well, that's it was. why he looked there. So you, are you, it looks they like look Sandy, embarrassed. Are you they embarrassed. look embarrassed. Yeah, that's how he looks like. He looks like he's just about to say, "Are you kidding me?" And they took the photo. <laughs> because this was a guy. What was he? A, a, something in the air force or a captain or whatever. And he's standing there with little pieces of tin foil spread out on the floor. And oh, this yeah. is what we mistook for a flying craft. A saucer. Yeah. That, that spread over a miles thing, but the debris they've got there is like you could, you could fit in a, in a, in a trash can, as you guys would call it, you know, a wheelie bin, as you would say, or a wheelie bin. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Be it a bit of a bigger wheelie bin, even if, even if, even if it was a whole balloon system and everything like that, people have found them balloon systems for years and years and years, like they said, and loads of people have been stood around them when they found them and not been in awe of them and going, it's an alien spaceship. So work that out. They've got all those cases they're saying about, oh, all these people turn up to these crashed balloons, you know, and it's like a circus, as they say. Right? And like not one did you hear people saying, oh, we didn't know it was man-made when we found exactly. it crashing. Exactly. Not one of them people looked because like it's said, got oh, this Air Force or NASA or stuff emblazoned all over it. Uh, probably warning signs, do not touch, do not disturb, property of the U.S. government. Yeah, there you go. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. When I was a little kid, I found a thing that had come off of a weather balloon. It was just like the balloon knot was all that was left tied to a string, and it had a little like a, a drive battery about the size of a nine volt, but it was like a wafer battery had a little, uh, like a flashlight bulb sorted onto it with a couple of wires. Uh, and, um, and it had a little thing on it. You know, if, if you find this, uh, contact, uh, Noah weather services or whatever, my dog had to play with it, but yeah, I didn't think, Oh, this came from space. It's, it's of alien manufacturer. Oh, wow. I've never seen a battery light. like this and a light bulb soldered to it. Wow. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> No, but what I'm saying the discerning mind I was like away seven years you. old and I knew okay it's a battery there, this you, is there what's you go left and that's a, a seven year old child so you think yeah. a fully grown man finding something and he's a farmer as well farmers are usually pretty savvy people yeah you know they, they they're normally pretty you know because they're machine orientated they used to fix in their own machinery yeah they, back in the day they had steam-powered tractors you know and stuff yeah. like that that's yeah, they they did a lot of engineering in that those those guys, you know, and they were they were strong and they were fit and they were mentally healthy, you know. And I I don't think they would have turned up onto that farm and gone, oh, oh look, it's it's not a weather balloon. <laughs> <laughs> and then why would they hustle who Mac Brazel? I think that was on his farm. They saw him in town with some people from the government and he had a, a scared look on his face. They put him in the back of a car and drove him away. Exactly. And then I when mean, he came not, back, he the, didn't the want to talk thing about is, it. It wouldn't have been that top secret when you're talking about a bloody balloon. I'm sorry to shoo people away, scare people off talking about it and stuff. Get on project mogul. Yes. Yeah, so what? So, <laughs> so what? What threat is some little and, civilian going to do in the middle of bloody Roswell in New Mexico? Stuff. It was a what, it was a six hundred uh, yard long string of balloons or something for Project Mogul carrying all this equipment and stuff, and that might have produced a big debris field. But none of that would have not not a mile wide un, though. They're not man -made. Not a mile wide in each direction, kind of thing. And the other thing, like like I said, right? If <laughs> what would it matter? What makes them think? That some guy from Roswell, New Mexico, a farmer, is going to bother. What's he going to do? Try and talk to the Japanese or something? You know what I mean? Talk to the Russians? What are you? What are you on about, you weirdos? There's yeah. something deeper. You wouldn't. You wouldn't threaten people's lives, and and all the rest of it to cover up some spy balloon. You, you just wouldn't. Yeah. 
And can see that that email address is correct, but you don't need the HTTPS in it. It's just an email address. Yeah, it's you not, never need to. Yeah, don't you don't need yeah, any don't hypertext need transfer address, protocol, whatever HTTPS And it would be correct. HTTPS dot dot forward slash forward slash www dot. Yeah, but that is the right. right. If you're going to do it, mate, if you're going to do it, do it right. All right. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that, other than the HTTP colon backslash backslash that's midnight mailbox 13 at gmail.com thank you Kathita. she had good intentions she, she had good good intentions mate but uh but but you're flawed <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna dock your pay Kathita. yeah that's it you only get three pence now instead of four <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of that this channel's got enough um, people eh, in it for to for you to apply for the old. Um... Yeah, we we just need the watch hours, and that's kind of what oh, we're doing here do. now. Of course you do. Yeah, I forgot about that because that's they've lowered it now, though, haven't they? Uh, I think it's four thousand or. Uh, no, that's how much it was. They've lowered yeah, it. I'm, I haven't looked to be honest. It, with might, it might be three. It might be three thousand now, that. but it's still a or long way off. If we were then, doing shorts, um, it was ten million views on uh, YouTube Shorts, but. I've done any shorts for this channel. No. Nah. Take out a show. No shorts necessary. Uh, no shorts necessary. Just long johns. And and uh, just to let everybody know, neither one of us are wearing pants. Yep. I don't wear pants when I do this show, Judies and Lenneman. As you know, you know, I like to, you know, hang loose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not let it actually dangle wearing, in the wind, pants. so to speak, you know. We, we were talking about that before the show. No, not this past time when I was on Coast to Coast, but... Uh, two or three years ago when I was on there, uh, I did that show pantless. I was in my underwear. And I thought, you know, this is kind of a little Easter egg for myself. I'm, two million people are listening to me, and I'm not wearing any pants. But don't, I didn't I didn't say that. <laughs> but the last time I was on with George Norrie a couple of weeks ago, I was fully clothed. Yeah, so you say Yep. Just just ask Nicole, as you say in your lyrics there. <laughs> just, yeah, just ask Nicole, yeah. yeah. Steve Stockton, he's a hell of a guy. Just ask Nicole. Just ask Nicole. Yeah. I don't know what version that was I played last time, maybe. <laughs> it's different every time, and that's what I love about it. Uh, you could do a whole album of just uh, different versions <laughs> of uh, Steve the Steve Stockton, Stockton song. a hell of a guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the remix, the radio it. edit, the 12-inch dance <laughs> remix, the... <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you okay, dude? <laughs> Sound like you vapor locked there for a minute. Oh, I'm choking, mate. Choking. You're choking me up, mate. Make me laugh, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, Roswell's that. The, I think everybody's always going to go back to Roswell and, and, you know, that, and question that really the, mo the motive. It's if the motive there is a cover up. That's where it, it started. It, it, absolutely. Yeah, that that's it caused the hysteria about the thing because it was so blatantly obvious, you know, that one from one day to the next and and the the difference in attitudes towards it as well was just astounding. You know. Dummies. <laughs> the only dummies were them trying to well Yeah, trying to, to trying to make everybody out be a dummy. Dummies, yeah. Uh, I don't buy the official explanation. No, and like I said, and it's always going to leave intrigue, isn't it? Because because they lied. Whatever it was, the Project Mogul, whatever they kept throwing in, oh, it's not, it wasn't that, it was this, yeah. it wasn't that, it was this, it wasn't and that, it was this. They, they you know, you told keep, a different you tale about a lot of things. making up new things. stories for it, you know. We could, we could get into all these conspiracy theories, and a lot of it's conspiracy facts. I've talked about Project Paperclip, and how people tried to debunk that and say that never happened, but it certainly did. My dad worked with a lot of those guys that were brought over from Germany and put to work in the National Laboratory. So yeah. there you go. First hand knowledge of that. Well, yeah. from my father. Well, yeah, from your father, yeah. But that's still, you know, even though it's second hand, you you know what he was telling you wouldn't have been yeah. the bull. And then you I know. talked about the kid that I went home with, had a German name and uh uh his father was uh, had spoke with a very thick German accent. I was over at his house one day after school. He took me down into the basement. Back then, in the seventies, all these basement ranchers they would turn the 
uh, the, the room in the basement into a rec room or a family room. We were down there watching Gillian's Island or something. And he said, come here, I want to show you something. And he goes to the, the back of the, they have the simulated wood grain paneling there. He pushes on a section and it opens up. And I thought, no, oh, he's going to show me a bomb shelter. Okay, a lot of houses built during, right after the war in the Cold War era had those bomb shelters. I think I've seen these, but I'll hear him. Well, he goes in there and he flips on the light. And it was the biggest collection in, in one little room of uh, German war memorabilia that I've ever seen. And I'm like, wow, uh, I'll call him Tom. Tom, your dad really takes his memorabilia seriously. And he patted on a display case there that had a Luftwaffe or SS something uniform in there. And he said, you don't understand. He said, this was my dad's uniform. And he, he and his dad, my dad worked together right there at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So crazy. But no, crazy. Project Paperclip, that never happened. How preposterous. Yeah, it's all lies. Like I said, everything is swamp gas, right? <laughs> well, here's somebody that uh, lived in Roswell. Can't dance. What do you think happened back in 1947? Do you think it was a, a crash saucer or do you think it was a weather balloon? I'm pretty sure he'd say that it's not a bloody weather balloon. And I'm pretty sure everybody that lived in that area would have said the same and thing. And I, I lived in New Mexico for about a year, but um, I wasn't that close to Roswell. I was close to the, the Aztec crash site, though. And uh, I've talked about that before. If you're going to crash something that you were flying in, uh, sand would be perfect place to, to, to ditch. Yeah. And, uh, the the softest go. ground you could find, isn't it? If it's not water, it's, it's, it's yeah. that. Yeah. There you go. Can't dance. Yeah. Uh, somebody who lived in Roswell, done by the weather balloon. Yeah, because That's they're taking people for people. idiots. That's why. And like saying there's 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 there was dummies that the the bodies were dummies. Yeah, because you'd mistake a five foot six dummy for a three foot alien, wouldn't you? You know, with a massive head and, this, and big almond eyes. Of this course, kind yeah. of says it all right here. The government reaction is all I need to see in order to know something was up. Yeah, definitely, exactly. Because they wouldn't. Re I said that, didn't I? Yep. Why would they threaten people? Why would they Why would they scoop people away? Why would they stop people talking? If it's nothing even to worry about, and it's, like I said, it, it would have to be way more serious than a bloody weather balloon, right? Because <laughs> they just say it's a weather balloon. Not a problem, right? In the very first place. When they came out and released the story of that, they noticed the mass hysteria. That's what it was. And then they yep. thought, well, hang on a minute. We need to get a grip of this because we could use the technology. That's what that was. You know for a fact it's a technology grab. You know? Yep. So and then you have people they like they the, the guy we talked about the other week, Bob they, Lazar they, and the yeah. Phil Schneider that reverse engineered those things. And a lot of the stuff we have today, yep. like a telephone that can fold. Yep. Well, I've, and not I've already right. said all this. I've said Any all this. phone can fold, but this, uh, most of them yeah. can just do it once. Try that with an iPhone. But like I said, if we're time. allowed to have these computers in our hand and, and computers that we work on, all this technology, this is what you call throwaway technology because the masses can have it. So and you if think got how this, far advanced of that they are. And can hold this in my hand and, and make it do all these crazy things. Imagine yeah. what uh, the government has. We're kind of black exactly. ops. It, exactly. exactly. Well, the, 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 the secret sure ops and stuff, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you keep freezing for some reason, mate. You and your Wi-Fi. <laughs> you need a good nice wire, night. mate, and shove it in. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a, a connection over here. I've got a Cat5 cable that I can plug straight in, but I'm kind of clumsy, and I always, I'll always i trip over my headphone cords and mic cords and stuff anyway, and if I ran that, even though it's bright blue, if I ran that over here, I'd probably tear the whole TV and router and everything out <laughs> over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> connection seems good there does it um that's not that's not good enough I'm, 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 I'm hoping i keep that, seeing uh, him freeze it's all about me it's not about I'm hoping that eventually the they'll get a uh, fios or something in here instead of this clown outfit that this is the only internet game in town and i didn't think they could do that i didn't think that they could have a monopoly i didn't think you could have a monopoly like that but uh it certainly is here in new england where i'm at that's it's that or nothing, or I guess I could get. Uh, well, maybe it's not uh, Monopoly, maybe uh, it's Scrabble. Satellite. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Candyland, I think. Mousetrap. 
Woo. Hello, blue chicken. Fancy seeing... Uh, Blue Chicken's another one that's got his own song, courtesy of, of Lee G. He's got more than one bloody song. <laughs> there's been, there's, there's been um, a, a, a lot, a lot, a hell of a lot. Oh. I lose count of how many chicken songs there was. <laughs> there was Buck Me. <laughs> See what you did there. <laughs> there was, though. We named one of them Buck Me. Because that's the way chickens talk. Book, 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 book. Well, they, well, they, well, they do. They do. It's true. You know, like I said. And chickens do have a language. Uh, we had chickens when I was a kid. You could tell, like, when one lays an egg and gets excited, there's a certain cackle that a they make. Tone, or yeah. if they're kind of yeah. bored, or if they're just if they're wanting to be fed, or if there's a, a predator, you know, a, a skunk or a big bird or something, they've got another squawk that they do. Yeah, chickens yeah. can talk. Yeah. They speak yeah. chicken. Do you speak chicken? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a chicken hawk. I'm not a chicken, I'm a chicken hawk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, boy. Foghorn Leghorn, ladies and gentlemen. I still love Foghorn Leghorn. Yeah, there's something else. I, I, a lot of those cartoons, I can't show them anymore because it would offend too many people, but. Oh, God, yeah, you can't do anything anymore because you would offend some blooming flake. No one's got a backbone anymore, have they? You've just they're offended all, all the flakes by saying that. <laughs> every, every, yeah, well, I'm offended that they're offended. There you go. <laughs> uh, everybody's lost their spine. There's no such thing as a spine See, anymore. It's just this, this soft, soft vertebrae. <laughs> Do that. There, there seems to be a paranormal connection with UFOs, which I, I believe there's a Bigfoot connection there, too. And uh, they they've seen lots of shadow people in Roswell that stopped when they moved. You yeah, know, that's a it's... weird phenomenon, that is, the old shadow yeah. people. But I, I see, how do we know that it's not a breakdown in the in the veil of our our, our spectrum of, of viewing and, you know, sight, sound? All those things. How do we know it's not a slight evolution in us that yeah. we're seeing into more dimensions? You know, I've heard that that uh, people say that uh, the, all the pictures of Bigfoot are blurry because Bigfoot is blurry. It's able to uh, change its frequency that it vibrates at so that it can't be seen go. like a cloak we'll, we'll and like instance, a chameleon does with sight. It can do it. Yeah, with, yeah. We we'll say, for instance, else. that we vibrate at a particular frequency, which we do, right? All our everything on planet Earth vibrates at a particular frequency, right? So you'd only have to tweak that a billionth of a degree to blur it out or to not see it at all. And and the light spectrum, you know, the entire light yep. spectrum is like this, and we see about yep. this much of it. Well, no, if you if you see the light spectrum on a on a proper spectrum, it'd be like say from from England to New York, the light spectrum, and we see a millimeter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um. It's incredible. We are incredibly blind, really. You know, when it comes to sight, we think we see loads, but we don't. <laughs> There's so much we don't see. No. So it'd be so m- coupled with vibration, like you say, frequency, and the fact that we don't see very well. In reality, it's quite possible that there's things running around that, that are always there, and we we just don't see them and they vibrate past us because anything that vibrates differently to our our vibration anyway could pass straight through you yeah and have a different a different um world built with it on this same planet an alternate dimension yeah absolutely i've talked about that in regards to missing people cases over on missing persons mysteries how do you know they so, haven't stepped into another through a portal into it onto you know just yeah, into another, like these another people that, of existence on this the ones that, that do survive and are found and come back say so i was hiking along suddenly realized i'm not on the trail i looked back and can't see where i've been on a trail and i don't recognize any of this and these trees don't look right the, the sun's in a different place or sometimes yeah. they can see search and rescue and hear them, but they can't be seen or heard, and they're just yeah. within strange, yards of each other. Like you're looking through a glass. It's a strange, thing strange that has stuff. No, 
uh, has no can't be seen by someone else. Like looking through a two way mirror. Crazy. Yep. Life. Don't talk to me about it. Well, Lee, we're about out of time here. The old clock on the <laughs> wall. We, we got yeah, our, our uh, hour in tonight, a little bit over. I want to thank everybody for being here on Yeah, thanks, Saint everyone. Lee with a reverb. On From Beyond. There you go. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we'll see you next week for more uh, UFO and related phenomena. Uh, silliness and, and maybe some serious discussion too. We have a good time. That's what it's all about. Um, we're not live we're long, live long and, and prosper. prosper. We're uh, we're not looking for the answers. We're just looking for the next set of questions. Yeah, totally. But, uh, yeah. But again, uh, see Lee G tomorrow night on uh, his channel, First Floor Audio, where he'll be doing Radio Watch your show. FA back to back original tracks. It's a full pint, mate. Not off. <laughs> I love that over there. I, I might even join him tomorrow night on camera over there. And then I've got videos coming out. Um, I think uh, I've got, I can't remember what's premiering tomorrow. I've got a bunch scheduled ahead of time. I believe it's people that survived uh, things in the wilderness. And then I've got a uh, thing about Bohemian Grove coming out Friday. And um, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of stuff coming out. So uh, it's, it's worth taking a look. We should, you should do one one day on symbology as well. That would actually be good for this sh this show as well. Symbology. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, it was a guy, Tex Mars, I think, that uh, Codex Magic, I think it was, where he looked into all the different symbols and their meanings and then how you can find them on public buildings and things. That's, yeah, they're everywhere. That's the way a lot of these people communicate with them. They do it in plain sight. They hide yep. in plain sight. And, yep. uh, you just have to know what to look for. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do, let's do that. That'd be good, that one. Yeah, we'll, we'll plan on that one. All right, folks, well, we're going to get on out of here. Uh, on behalf of Lee G and myself, we'll see you a little further on down the trail. Tell your animals and say hi. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Lee's going to play us out here. <laughs>